Good morning. As you know, it's November, and as well as Bonfire Night, we also commemorate in this month those people who died or were injured in wars, most specifically the First and Second World War. Last year I spoke about men, Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Edward Thomas, who had written poetry in World War I. This year I thought I'd look at women's poetry. The scholar Catherine Riley has collected lots of women's poetry of World War I in a collection called Scars Upon My Heart. You can see the cover of the book there. Above that is a stamp which shows us where that quotation came from. It was from uh, Vera Britton, who we'll look at later, describing her brother's physical war injuries as being like mental injuries to herself, scars upon my heart. And this quote hits on an important distinction between men's and women's poetry. Men experienced the battlegrounds at first hand. But women's poetry is more about the effects of war on those who did not fight, but who were just as deeply affected by the conflict. This does not mean to say, of course, that all women did was wait at home. Of course not. They played a very important part in both world wars. In the first war, they volunteered as nurses as you can see in that first picture, and served abroad as well, quite often very close to the front line. They would work in munitions factories, making the weapons that would be needed for the war and aeroplanes, as you can see there. And in the middle, uh, some clues as to the sort of jobs that women might have. They would be uh, nurses, hospital orderlies, and uh, they would often serve uh, in other capacities as well, on buses and on trains and keeping the country going. So, of course, they had a very big role to play in the war. And that's before we even consider the very important role they had as homemakers and looking after children and bringing up the next generation. Uh, although it is uh, men often who cause wars, they're uh, not averse to using women as propaganda either to uh, encourage men to fight. You see in the first poster a picture of an Irish woman talking to an Irish man and saying to the man, will you go or must I? Which is a, a blatant attempt to use emotional blackmail to say, are you a man or a mouse? Of course, there's a lot of artistic license in this picture. I don't think actually you can see Belgium from Ireland, but uh, there you go. That's uh, Belgium on fire, which was, of course, uh, where the uh, First World War started because Britain had a treaty with the Belgians, which the Germans rode roughshod over. And there were quite a lot of emotional um, punch behind stories that came out that uh, the Belgians were being mistreated by the Germans. This is also shown in this second poster, an Australian one, which talks to women of Queensland and says, remember how women and children of France and Belgium were treated? Do you realise that your treatment would be worse? There's no actual facts to back all that up, of course. That is all to uh, make women feel frightened and threatened by the war and therefore to encourage men to fight in it for at the bottom of the page it says send a man today to fight for you. So we can see here how women were used as tools of propaganda. In our own country uh, we were just as culpable of using women in that highly emotive way. There you see two women looking out of a window with a, a boy clutching onto his mother's skirts or possibly his sister's, looking out at the soldiers as they march to the front. Women of Britain say go. This was also true, of course, on the other side, on the enemy side. And there we see a German woman seemingly giving a hand grenade to a German soldier, encouraging him to fight. Uh, German women being encouraged there. German women join up uh, with the homeland front. 
to keep Germany going whilst the menfolk are fighting. Let's have a look then at some of the poetry that was written by women during World War I. The first poet we're going to look at is Vera Britton. There's a picture of her. She's wearing her nurse's uniform. She served as a nurse during World War I. And as a very young woman, she was engaged to Roland Leighton. You can see a picture of him there on the left hand side. Sadly, he died very near to Christmas Day, December 23rd, 1915. And uh, it's likely that Vera received news of his death, possibly on Christmas Day itself. Uh, she writes a poem about how this has affected her. Vera Britton wrote about her fiancé's death. He is the person R.A.L., Roland Leighton. Died of wounds in France December the 23rd, 1915, relatively early on in the war. This poem is called Perhaps. And it's really about what it feels like to lose somebody and uh, how you can recover from that and move on. Perhaps someday the sun will shine again and I shall see that still the skies are blue and feel once more I do not live in vain, although bereft of you. Perhaps the golden meadows at my feet will make the sunny hours of spring seem gay. And I shall find the white may blossom sweet, though you have passed away. Perhaps the summer woods will shimmer bright and crimson roses once again be fair. And autumn harvest fields a rich delight, although you are not there. Perhaps some day I shall not shrink in pain to see the passing of the dying year. And listen to the Christmas songs again, although you cannot hear. Though kind time may many joys renew, there is one greatest joy I shall not know again, because my heart for loss of you was broken long ago. That's a very poignant poem. You'll notice that the word you was spelt with capital letters, just to show the importance of Roland in her life. And yes, it is about recovery, but it's also about how things actually are completely changed. So you can recover, but maybe not 100%. We're going to look now at the poetry of another female poet of World War I, Charlotte Mew. This poem is all about contrast. In June, roses come out. The little boy you can sort of see illustrated there. The young innocent boy picks the rose in June. You can see another picture there showing the devastation of life out on the front. That war has affected things so much that simple beauties like June's first rose are forgotten. People have become cynical and hardened and bitter. And the reason why it's about contrast is because the little boy still has this great uh, joy of life he still loves to see the rose and uh, he's, uh, there's a difference between the way the boy sees the world and the way adults now see the world and it's trying to show that contrast. June 1915. Who thinks of June's first rose today? Only some child, perhaps. With shining eyes and rough bright hair will reach it down in a green sunny lane. To us, almost as far away as are the fearless stars from these veiled lamps of town. What's little June to a great broken world with eyes gone dim from too much looking on the face of grief, the face of dread? Or what's the broken world? to June and him of the small, eager hand, the shining eyes, the rough, bright head. I think the poet is trying to say that the world and, and its warfare and its conflict has let down the boy who has a, a childhood innocence. The last poet we're going to look at today is Marjorie Wilson, also a nurse like Vera Britton. 
and um, she's writing uh, in the style of somebody talking to her nephew, reminding him of his father, who is her brother. You can see a picture of him there, and he, of course, died in World War I. Unlike the other two poems, this poem is set at the end of the war. It's all to do with looking back, sadly, on uh, her brother, TPCW, those are his initials, and it is written to his son Tony, aged three. It is very much a hymn of praise to her brother. Gemmed with white daisies was the great green world your restless feet have pressed this long day through. Come now, and let me whisper to your dreams a little song grown from my love for you. There was a man once loved green fields like you. He drew his knowledge from the wild bird songs, and he had praise for every beauteous thing, and he had pity for all piteous wrongs. A lover of earth's forest, of her hills, and brother to her sunlight, to her rain, man with a boy's fresh wonder. He was great, with greatness all too simple to explain. He was a dreamer and a poet, and brave to face and hold what he alone found true. He was a comrade of the old, a friend to every little laughing child like you. And when across the peaceful English land, unhurt by war, the light is growing dim, and you remember by your shadowed bed all those, the brave, you must remember him, and know that it was for you who bear his name, and such of you, that all his joy he gave, his love of quiet fields, his youth, his life, to win that heritage of peace you have. Some of the language in that, of course, is quite difficult. But what it's what it's trying to say is that uh, that the men fought for peace. The men fought so that the next generation could have peace. As we know, of course, that didn't really happen because World War II occurred. But that was the hope. So as you can see, women poets uh, played a great part in uh, the literature of the World Wars. And they were able to see very clearly uh, the perspective of somebody who, uh, although not actual combatants in war, very keenly felt the ramifications of the war. Often women, of course, were, were left to bring up children alone and all they were left with were memories. That's something to think about as we come to Remembrance Day.